being uh, co-convened by the Department of uh, Politics at the University of uh, York, um, Atlantic Council's South Asia Center, um, and the Asia Pacific program of the Chatham House. Uh, so thank you for joining us. I am Rudabi Shahid, a non-resident senior fellow at the uh, South Asia Center of the Atlantic Council and a postdoctoral uh, fellow at the uh, Department of Politics, University of York. My fellow uh, conveners uh, of this series are Dr. In, uh, Indrajit Roy, senior lecturer, uh, global uh, developmental uh, de development politics at the uh, University of York. Dr. Champa Patel, Director of the Asia Pacific Program at the Chatham House, and Dr. Uh, Buddhadev uh, Halder, uh, Postdoctoral Research Associate at the Reimagining Citizenship uh, Program at the University of York. So the series is designed to invite reflections on uh, politics, citizenship, and democracy in the geo uh, politically, economically, and ecologically fragile uh, South Asian region whose various countries will begin to celebrate the 75th anniversary of independence from Britain in the next few months. And of course, this year, Bangladesh is um, celebrating uh, uh, the liberation uh, war from uh, Pakistan. So it's the 50th anniversary. So in this first uh, webinar, we have gathered to reflect on the just concluded elections in the Eastern Indian states of Assam and uh, West Bengal. So Assam is a part of Northeast India, but uh, for, uh, for ease uh, of this program, we are considering it uh, Eastern. And uh, their implications for the entire region. So in the previous panel, we obtained insights from a domestic point of view from Aman Wadud, uh, Kasturi Basu, and uh, Harsh Mandir on the likely social consequences of the elections for uh, West Bengal and Assam. So in this panel, our uh, speakers, Shoeb Daniel, uh, Dr. Meghna Guhathakurta, and uh, Dr. Ali Riaz will walk us through the broader regional and international ramifications of the elections. We don't often reflect on the international implications of uh, provincial elections, but this is precisely what we are hoping to do in uh, this session that we are having now. So uh, I'll um, go to Shoeb first. So uh, Shoeb, do you think that the win of the TMC in West Bengal and the BJP uh, in Assam uh, will affect India-Bangladesh relations in uh, any way? And you have precisely five minutes for that. Thank you, Rosabe. So, uh, you know, just, shoop, so just I'm going to start off with the super short answer. The answer is, it's going to affect it very little. But I'm going to expand on that to sort of, you know, uh, uh, maybe illustrate some of the crinkles in that answer too. So the first thing, which is why we've been discussing this, is that uh, the BJP for the last, uh, say, uh, two to three years has really brought up the issue of citizenship, uh, using issues like uh, the National Register of Citizens, the Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, you know, these two sort of prongs. So this was obviously, this has a long history in Assam, uh, the issue of citizenship. Uh, but, you know, it was really a new issue for Bengal, where in spite of the fact that the, the state has seen millions of refugees come in from uh, what was uh, then East Pakistan and then later Bangladesh, uh, Bengal really hasn't seen uh, any of the sort of anti-refugee, uh, uh, anti anti-immigrants, xenophobic politics, uh, which, which maybe was there in Assam before that. But obviously this has changed where uh, the BJP is now the main opposition. So that is, that is how you know, we're discussing the international ramifications of both the Assam and the Bengal elections. The first thing is now after the Bengal defeat, the chances of uh, an NRC, you know, as Aman had sort of raised in, the, in, in panel one, the chances of an NRC, both All India as well as in Bengal. Remember NRC, just for anybody who's not aware, is a citizenship verification process, which uh, tries to identify using paperwork work which goes back maybe sometimes two, three, four generations to find out whether you're quote unquote genuine Indian citizen. It's quite unique, uh, you know, by global standards, the sort of process that uh, the NRC has applied in Assam. And maybe we can assume it would apply if there was ever a national NRC. So after the Bengal defeat, remember the chances of a national NRC are rather low. 
uh, although the BJP did not actually raise the NRC as an issue in 2021, uh, it's still, it, it was still a voting issue. It's a, you know, it, it actually suffered because of it in 2021. Uh, this is something that I've seen, you know, in my reporting as well as a lot of other commentators have uh, raised. So in this way, this will actually help, uh, uh, will actually help bring Indian Bangladesh together because it will lessen a, a node of pressure on the Bangladesh government. Remember, uh, the Hasina government has come under attack domestically in, within Bangladesh for being a bit too close to the Modi government at a time when it, the ruling party in India has actually been attacking, uh, you know, allegedly illegal immigration for Bangladesh. So this is sort of, you know, just in a, in a sort of, in a coincidental way, it will lessen pressure on the Hasina government. Remember Hasina, uh, the Bangladesh government actually came under pressure during the Bengal elections itself uh, for allowing Prime Minister Modi to visit a temple in Bangladesh, which was used uh, by the BJP as a sort of campaign issue in West Bengal. It's a bit complicated. I'm not going to go into the details. So this sort of thing might become, uh, you know, might become, might become lesser. Uh, the counter to that is that, remember now the BJP is the main opposition in, in West Bengal as Kasturi raised, it has 40% of the votes. So two out of five Bengali voters voted for the BJP. It sort of cements itself in Assam as the ruling party, right? Uh, you know, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's really been in power a long time. So the, the, the communal politics that the BJP pushes, uh, the BJP, remember, depends mostly on the Hindu vote. It, it, it does not even, uh, in some ways, quote the Muslim vote. And in, we've seen both in Bengal and Assam, the BJP has, due to this politics, it's been very keen to, uh, you know, sort of bring up the issues of the Bengal partition right from 1947. So this means that obviously Bangladesh is constantly bought in to a domestic Indian conversation. So that will obviously heighten the pressure on Bangladesh. Of course, as we discuss these things, you must remember the India-Bangladesh relationship is a, a, a lot deeper uh, than Assam or, or West Bengal or the NRC or CA. You know, I mean, just if you just look at the map of South Asia, Bangladesh is surrounded on three sides by India. So, uh, you know, uh, the fact that India and Bangladesh, the governments of India and Bangladesh have such close relations is not really a coincidence. It's really, you know, the, the large forces uh, working to, uh, which have bought, it, bought us to this instance and will probably keep us going along that line. So I really think it will have not much of an impact uh, going forward. That's all. Okay, so that was, uh, you know, very, very uh, brief and succinct. Uh, so now we uh, go over to uh, Dr. Guha Thakurta. So, uh, so the question that uh, I, I have for you is, um, you know, how do uh, religious minorities in Bangladesh, especially uh, the Hindu community, perceive the TMC's win in uh, West Bengal and the BJP's victory in Assam? Okay, um, just um, to give you a, a very brief view of what I gathered in the last few days by talking to people all around the country over phone, of course, because we're in lockdown. Uh, but um, so the thing is, there are two issues that um, are on the top of uh, the, the Hindu minority, especially, but also I've covered other minorities as well. Um, in their mind. One is the issue of the protection of minorities, Hindu minorities within Bangladesh and the BJP's agenda on it. And the other is um, the issue of the sharing of the Tista waters, which is a foreign policy issue, but it's still there. Um, so in, as Shweb has said, we've had a recent, this particular election uh, was um, particularly for Bangladesh, it was highlight points was the fact of the Modi visit to uh, just before elections in West Bengal, the visit of uh, Modi to Bangladesh as a guest of the Bangladeshi uh, um, government, uh, which is celebrating its 50 years anniversary. So uh, whatever controversy that had created anyway, the visit went smoothly even during partial lockdown uh, measures. But um, the, uh, so there is a varied difference of opinion on these two issues among the Hindu minorities. One is the Southern part of Bangladesh, which where Modi had visited near the Sundarbans, where he brought in all this Matua, and he had actually gone to a Matua community in Faridpur as well. 
uh, Gopalganj, where uh, these two areas uh, in the southern part of Bangladesh, um, at, before Modi visit, they were about 50-50 uh, in, in divided in whether to support, you know, in mentally uh, and also physically because um, many of their relatives have gone to India and are uh, present as Indian citizens or even now under the CA Act, the illegal migrants uh, issues have come up. But uh, so they are have been 50-50. Uh, some of them wanted BJP to win, some of them wanted TN, uh, Trinamool to win. But uh, I think, uh, but after the Modi visit, somehow or the other, and I know from witnesses there that uh, they have uh, solely, uh, you know, uh, converted uh, in, in the sense of 100% uh, wanted the BJP to win. The reason why was not at all anything to do with CA or NRC or anything, but protection of the Hindu minorities. And this is an issue and a big uh, agenda which has gotten uh, much more, um, uh, you know, focus uh, in the in Bangladesh. That uh, the Hindu minor, some of the Hindu minorities seem to think that if BJP is in power they will defend the Hindus, the plight of Hindus from persecution, like uh, land grabbing, et cetera, in Bangladesh. Not that they will defend them once uh, or encourage them to go to India or anything. That is not the issue. The issue is in Bangladesh, whether they'll get more protection from a BJP government. And if the BJP is there in West Bengal, the, it will be closer to home. This is an area which is shared only in the south, southern part of the country. But when I went to the ask the northern people, and especially among the western borders of uh, with uh, West Bengal, borders of West Bengal, they in from Jasor to the north, which is a uh, has op uh, which has the border openings like Benapol border uh, post and the hilly border in the north. Uh, they were divided. The traders and businessmen among the Hindu community, and there's a lot of Marwaris living in the north, uh, which have engaged very successful trading relations with West Bengal, have uh, people and their supporters in the Trinomul. So they would they uh, voice the fact that they were happy at the Trinomul win. On the other hand, in terms of sh sharing of Tista waters, the people around the Tista barrage uh, in the north, they are uh, they had been supporting the BJP because they thought that the BJP, uh, if because it was uh, the it was Mamata Banerjee who had been um, objecting to the sharing of the Tista waters, and the BJP had said, "Well, we can't do anything with West Bengal things like that." So uh, they were uh, in that kind of a, um, sort of a, you know uh, they were voicing that kind of opinion in terms of uh, the silets in. Uh, there were the, the Namoshudros, and, and you must realize that the Matuas and the Namoshudros, they, these Rajabongshis, they are the 70%, constitute 70% of the Hindu population in Bangladesh. So uh, it's their opinion. They were more or less also on that protection agenda of the BJP in favor of that. However, when you talk with Buddhists in Chittagong, they have, uh, they do not, uh, they wanted the status quo to remain, which is Trinomul to remain. So this is a quite a varied picture. And maybe in the uh, further questions, uh, I can come up with a few details. Thank you. Okay, so it's not uniform among the minorities. That's something no. that I learned today. Okay, so uh, moving on to uh, Dr. Riaz. So how should Bangladesh be looking at the results of the elections in terms of the BJP winning in Assam and uh, re-evaluating the NRC, uh, which, you know, the, the now the chief minister, he said uh, a few days ago, and the BJP losing in West Bengal, where now they uh, might face opposition in implementing the CAA and the NRC. So you too have five minutes. Thank you. First of all, that uh, there is no homogeneous response, as we have heard, not only among the minority communities. In general, there is no homogeneous, and there cannot be a homogeneous response or reaction. And also, your question is a normative part. How should it be, right? First, let us take into account that Assam, there hasn't been any change. BJP has been in power in Assam. 
you know. So the relationship or the reaction is not going to be different until and unless there is a shift in the federal government. That is whatever changes in Delhi. If the BJP is no longer in power in Delhi and Assam is still in the BJP power, the relationship dynamics will change. So far, it is not going to change. The question more is about West Bengal. Uh, and here also, the status quo has been maintained, despite the fact that we thought that uh, the, the early opinion polls might have suggested a BJP you know, victory. It hasn't happened. Nevertheless, the point is that uh, the BJP's rise in West I call it rise because, it, as we have discussed in the previous sessions, the, the, the most important element is the rhetoric is going to change. Completely. West Bengal politics rhetoric has been changed. Uh, the religion question and the Bangladesh question is at the forefront of this conversation uh, in, in the context of citizenship and other things. These are the elements that Bangladesh will have to address. Here I'm coming as a normative one. That these are the questions there. But that would be determined by the relationship between the Bangladesh government and the federal government. How and that relationship, as I will I will insist, is very unequal and a very political decision. Uh, so there would be a limit as to how Bangladesh can react. If you notice, the Bangladesh foreign minister's letter to uh, to Mamta Banerjee, that there is an implied and implicit message there that uh, we are happy that you won against this, you know, without mentioning BJP, <clears throat> the rhetoric that you know this kind of quality. These are these are words played into this game, but uh, in general, my my point is that <coughs> excuse me, my point is that uh, the relationship would be determined between Dhaka and Delhi, not Dhaka and West Bengal. The common misperception in Bangladesh, which has engendered support from BJP over the last years, is a misperception that it is the Mamta Banerjee who is stopping the Tista tree. Because the Indian federal government can do anything and absolutely can do anything, anything they want. They're not doing it. BJP is playing the game. And that game is part also has played inside Bangladesh. <coughs> As Meghna Gautakota was mentioning, look, what are the two elements, right? One is the so-called security. The, the minority community's perception that there'll be more security if BJP comes in. This is an absolute misperception. Absolute misperception because they're not persecuted not only because of their religious identity. There are so much things. Land grabbing is part of it. In Bangladesh, unless you are tied to the government, there is nobody who can grab your land. I mean, you cannot do it unless you're tied to it. If you want to grab my land, whether I'm a Hindu, Christian, Muslim, uh, poor, I, ha I will have to be poor, I will have to be marginalized, I will have to be in a situation that you, Rudaba, you will have to be connected to the power. And that has been happening for the last decade. Is there not any religious persecution there are? But to portray this entire thing as a religious dimension is overblown and misperception. So here, this perception has been put into the Hindu community that a BJP government in West Bengal is going to prevail. This is the BJP mentality. This is absolutely the BJP mentality. And this is the rhetoric that is going to play out in West Bengal for the next four or five years. Whether BJP will cash in, we'll see. But BJP is now a formidable force. And BJP, I'm not talking about the organization only. It is the mindset, it is the culture, it is what the political culture has shifted in West Bengal. This is what we have witnessed. Just let us not look into the number, whether they are 77 seats or now 75. That is not going to determine. So that is that is one thing. And with respect to the the second element, the the this the watershed. I, as I say it, as you know, as most of the people who have any idea what the federal government can do it, federal government is not going to. Why? Because they would like to use that one to create an image that Mamta Banerjee is the problem. It is the river linking project which is the problem. It is not Mamta Banerjee. Mamta Banerjee is doing what she is supposed to do for the constituency. Do I like it? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But I can understand 
and I can also understand the BJP's absolute nuisance rhetoric that it is Mamta Banerjee's story. So what should be what should be the Bangladesh response? Yes, the 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 heterogeneous response is what some of them in Bangladesh is a sigh of relief. BJP hasn't won, so as if the world uh, has become better place suddenly. No, BJP has not won, but BJP has made its mark. So let us not be complacent about it. If you think that BJP's victory or whatever DMC has stopped is going to change. Uh, and the second element is this. This election has once again proved we have never, let me take a step back. We have never discussed West Bengal and Assam election in the context of Bangladesh, did we? We didn't. Now we are talking about it. That means they have become so important. Why? Because that is the BJP politics. This is the politics that you practically are creating that re religious demarcation. And this, uh, this is what would determine foreign policy, the relationship. On the other hand, Bangladesh has become, Bangladesh card has become a card to play in Indian politics. How, you know, we previously used to hear that India card is being played in Bangladesh politics, right? Uh, who is going to, but, you know, but here Bangladesh politics has become this. I would, I would, I would, I would, I would you know, conclude. So this, this is a complex picture and a very, you know, black and white portrayal is going to do a serious disservice. My, my last point is that West Bengal and Assam politics, on the one hand, it's important for the particularity with respect to Bangladesh-India relationship, but there is more important dimension is Dhaka-Delhi relationship and the political understanding and relationship between the, the incumbents in both Delhi and in Dhaka. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Riaz. And may I also add to that, I mean, various studies have shown that the land uh, grabbing issues from the Hindu minority, it's actually done by supporters of uh, the secular parties, uh, not uh, Islamist uh, bent parties, uh, such as the Jamaat Islami. So uh, you may, uh, you know, our audience may want to look uh, that up. Uh, so uh, I'll go over to uh, Dr. Uh, Guha Thakurta for this uh, round two. We'll uh, start uh, with her, and uh, the um, the NRC is, of course, uh, you know, a contentious uh, issue in India uh, Bangladesh relations, NRC and the CA together. So, um, but let us consider the situation of South Asia's largest. Uh, stateless uh, population, the Rohingyas. How should we consider the amendments to the citizenship laws in India in relation to the situation of the Rohingyas? Because you are a scholar on the Rohingya issue as well. Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, I think what is uh, in terms of Rohingyas uh, and in terms of legal framework addressing Rohingyas, there is not much difference in Bangladesh and Indian framework because they are, um, uh, Bangladesh, uh, India has not ratified uh, the refugee convention uh, of uh, 52 and uh, 64 protocol, uh, but, and neither has Bangladesh and, and none of them, and they all take quite a strong stand against ratifying it. Um, but at the same time, India does have refugees, uh, the Tamil refugees, the Tibetan refugees, and also Bangladesh has Rohingya refugees. Again, uh, referring to the, to the speech of Modi when he came in, he said that yes, India will support, uh, will, um, is uh, and, uh, thanked Bangladesh for taking these uh, measures to uh, for um, giving shelter to Rohingyas and that it wants a sustainable uh, re uh, sort of sustainable return uh, of Rohingyas. But unfortunately, so far, Indian diplomacy has concerned it has not uh, supported that, even in the Modi government. Um, we know that um, uh, they have been uh, Bangladesh uh, uh, diplomatic uh, missions have time and again urged Indian government to take a strong stand uh, in Myanmar uh, 
uh, with the Myanmar government. But at that time, when the Rohingyas were coming here in Bangladesh, there was no, it actually took uh, uh, sort of the stand in favor of the Myanmar government. However, um, in terms of the question you asked, we know that in, in the India is sheltering around what, 40,000 Rohingyas in uh, different places like Hyderabad, uh, Kashmir, and uh, Delhi. Uh, so I think basically uh, it is uh, in the CAC, CAA and the NRC uh, uh, clauses, we see that there is again this clause called, which has been explained by Kasturi in the previous uh, panel, that uh, there is this clause called the persecution somewhere appearing here and there, the persecution of uh, minorities. And they of course in, entail uh, Hindu, Buddhist, Jain and Christians. Uh, they don't even include uh, ethnic minorities uh, uh, of the Northeast. Uh, so there, the, uh, this whole question of illegal migrants, immigrants, which have come up uh, in, in, the Indian, um, in the Indian system, judicial system, has been now brought to the forefront. Actually, in Bangladesh, it has always been there as well. We face the same problems because um, uh, we, uh, when, uh, when Rohingyas do seek justice or are caught in uh, various uh, criminal offenses or fraudulent measures, uh, as in India, they have been caught by asking, um, uh, trying to register for other other card, etc. So they uh, in Bangladesh too. They are um, they fall under the Passport Act and the and the Foreigners Act. And again, the answer is deportation if they are ever found. But now that Bangladesh is uh, in India, for example, I think basically this uh, whole question of stateless population has to be addressed. Um, and it is, it, it is not the same, but almost equated with the, um, the population that may become stateless, both in Assam and as well as in uh, West Bengal. After the 54 refugees, they fall under that, uh, the fact that they have to prove their, yeah, with papers. So very interestingly, I've always pointed out two years ago in Calcutta when the, it wasn't a reality yet, uh, but uh, we face an interesting uh, similarity in uh, Burma, in Myanmar, where the 1982 Citizenship Act, which is actually the root cause of the uh, uh, displacement of Rohingyas because they were not accepted as citizens or nor their ethnicity has been. So 82 Act, many uh, scholars have saying it is not the 82 Act per se which displaced the Rohingyas, but rather in the execution of that Act. So you have these categories and as you could see in the description given in uh, Assam or in West Bengal, no one has any clear idea about how to execute measures. Uh, it's not deportation, but measures of, uh, you know, how to uh, prevent uh, people from, um, you know, uh, being displaced and going into, in Indian case, they may go into other states. Uh, but in, uh, in but some, of course, as they fear, may come into Bangladesh, and that has been a live fear uh, in the beginning. I must say that um, the in the beginning, when the Assam uh, registers did take place, the, this fear was addressed diplomatically. As we say that this is a foreign policy issue. Every Dr. foreign Dr. policy Dr. issue Dr. has to be, yeah, has to be, um, yeah, has to be um, uh, taken into consideration between the relationship between the two governments, the Bangladesh government and the central government of India. Okay. So anyway, we will come back to that, but I think this is something to realize that the execution of the CAA and the NR, uh, NRC may have problems both for Indian citizens as well as the stateless people within uh, who are called illegal migrants in, in India. I completely understand. Sorry to cut you off there, uh, Dr. Guha Thakurta. I mean, statelessness, I also work in it uh, on it, and uh, there's so much to talk about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, the Rohingyas who are 
you know, uh, the most marginalized uh, group of people, uh, at least in South Asia, if not in the world. So um, I have to move on now. So uh, I will go to Shoeb now. So it's quite a longly uh, winded question, but uh, I know that, uh, you know, given your expertise on this whole region, you'll be able to uh, give us uh, your perspective. So India's uh, Eastern neighborhood was cultivated over decades as a peaceful, stable one, in contrast to the turbulent borders with uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the former USSR. The Eastern neighborhood was to be the linchpin of the Look East policy, or the Act East policy, and connections with uh, Eastern and uh, Southeastern Asia. However, it looks like there will be instability and suspicion in the years to come due to uh, the dynamics surrounding the CAA and NRC. How likely is this possibility to come to fruition? So it's a very long uh, winded question, but you only have three minutes for it. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I mean, if you look at the Lukis policy, it's a real, it's a no brainer. Uh, you know, Bangladesh is, as we all know, is doing spectacularly well economically. Uh, both Eastern India uh, and Northeastern India are not, uh, you know, are poor regions of India. Northeastern India especially suffers from a lack of connectivity with uh, the rest of India, as well as the Bay of Bengal, which could be ameliorated by, uh, you know, Bangladesh being helpful. So this is like a no brainer, but unfortunately uh, the BJP's uh, local outreach has sort of contradicted with uh, India's foreign policy goals on this uh, topic. So because of uh, the BJP attacking uh, Bangladeshis as a group, uh, the, you know, the Bangladesh government has come under attack domestically uh, for being seen as too close to India. And uh, this is also sort of uh, quit the pitch for India also, you know, because, you know, if it, if it ever wants to, uh, you know, uh, you know, have any contact with Bangladesh, it also can be attacked, you know, it's, it can be outflanked from the right or sort of be attacked from the left for being hypocritical for doing business with, uh, you know, Bangladeshis. So, you know, uh, recently when Bangladesh actually sent, uh, you know, a consignment of Remdesivir, which is uh, medicine being used to treat covid uh, you know, this very simple act of uh, sort of neighborly relations came under attack because of this, you know, last three years of politics that uh, we've been seeing. Now, the silver lining here is that uh, there is very little chance of actually a lot of the rhetoric that the BJP has brought into politics actually being implemented on the ground, uh, you know, even substantially. I don't think it's ever going to be implemented in full measure. But even substantially, the BJP's political citizenship is so dislocatory that it's very unlikely that they will be implemented in any real measure on the ground. Just to bring up, for example, the CA, the Citizenship Amendment Act, which sort of uh, allows, uh, which allows undocumented migrants from Bangladesh, Afghanistan, and Pakistan to become Indian citizens. Remember, there was no channel for undocumented migrants before this to apply for Indian citizenship in the first place, but the CA does do that. Remember, the CA, India has historically never encouraged migration from Bangladesh. So there has actually been a big disconnect in the way India has approached its eastern partition and its western partition. So in, in the western partition, there was an explicit recognition that there will be an, you know, quote unquote, exchange of populations. And, uh, you know, there were, there were these explicit uh, arrangements made for refugees coming in from Pakistan. Uh, Bangladesh, there was nothing like that done. Uh, the, the, the migration was always discouraged. In many ways, actually, in spite of the rhetoric, CA actually continues that uh, Indian policy. Remember, the CA has a cutoff. So the CA uh, is not applicable for anyone coming into India beyond 2014. So it's not applicable for anyone in Bangladesh currently. So it's only if you've sort of entered India before 2014 and you're not Muslim, is the CA applicable to you. Uh, the secondly, the CA is extremely thorny to work through uh, I, I still don't know how, you know, if you ask me personally, how, you know, there'll be a actual working of the act, maybe that, because remember, it sort of excludes Muslims, and it excludes, uh, uh, it only has three countries. So I, I'm not really sure how they will, uh, how they'll identify who is, say, a Bangladeshi Hindu, because clearly Bangladesh is not going to cooperate, because we're sort of, uh, uh, we're sort of implicating Bangladesh for uh, uh, religiously persecuting this person. So clearly the government of Bangladesh is not going to cooperate to identify who is a Hindu and who is a Muslim. So I'm not really sure how it's going to be implemented. Remember, it's been one and a half years since the CA was passed. It was passed in December of 2019. And it still hasn't been implemented. So, you know, uh, it's going to be a thorny thing to implement. 
the nrc is even more difficult uh, you are talking about carrying out a nationwide exercise for you know 200 million people which is larger than most countries i mean indian muslims are a 200 billion strong population it's is really quite impossible uh, it's it's it was done in assam but remember assam is 2% of india's population plus it has a a long and often violent history of you know anti foreigner xenophobic politics which is really not there in many other states in india so often what the bjp brings in uh is a sort of new sort of politics so for example in west bengal when it bought in the nrc politics in 2019 it actually got burnt because it did not realize it sort of bought it in thinking it would be quote unquote anti muslim but it actually turned out that bengal actually uh, as it learned that it actually has a refugee politics which is often largely uh centered around uh, hindu refugees who had come from bangladesh so they also got alarmed so bjp went into this tail spin with respect to nrc which it couldn't understand and if you look at in if you look at the election campaign in 2021 they have not touched nrc nrc has been a word like waldemort in the 2020 election it cannot be named by a bjp leader uh, it will just not be named you will have to uh, i mean they will not name it they might name ca although that's also has been touched upon too much because it's not been implemented in law but nrc has not been touched at all uh the third thing is that you know mr modi himself is in a weak position uh given the you know the 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 terrible way in which india has been hit india has been economically hit uh, due to covid so it seems highly unlikely that these in the incredible rhetorical heights that you know citizenship has reached in 2019 and just after the election when c uh, when ca had been passed would ever get implemented so i mean while obviously we will see a bit more instability on the eastern front i don't think we'll reach anything even close to what we have uh, on india's pakistan border so i think we'll still see a strong india bangladesh relationship uh, in the next say you know in the, in the near future say in the next 3 5 years i know sure that was a very long question that i had for you and it was you know hard to answer in uh, just a few minutes um and i know that i've seen your pictures in the ca protest if i'm not wrong so uh, you were there as well uh so um yeah um i um i i will move on to our uh, third uh, guest and um we'll talk about the immediate uh, neighborhood and uh, you know bangladesh's uh, relations uh, you know how it's affecting you know its relations with china so it appears um, professor riaz that it appears that there is pressure on bangladesh to take sides by joining uh, the quad after years of what one may term as a great india china balancing act do you think that the rhetoric of the bjp over the years has demoralized bangladeshi policy makers Uh, as we've seen with the prime minister uh, sheikh hasina saying that the ca was unnecessary and it uh, and you know this may have uh, made the policy makers warm up to china of course there are trade issues as well so do you think that china is increasingly trying to exert its influence in bangladesh's foreign policy you know uh, we were in a, a panel a few days ago and uh, you know this this was also discussed and uh, we know that you know the ambassador uh, uh, the chinese ambassador to bangladesh made a few comments about the quad and bangladesh not joining it uh, possibly instructing you know the, the manner in which it was said the said so can you shed some light on that the chinese reaction to what they perceive as a bangladesh possibility of joining quad is simultaneously not so surprising but unusual unusual in the sense the chinese and why usually doesn't make such a direct comment they had to backtrack as you know they have later backtracks so. but when something is said can you unsay it? you have said it you, know? <laughs> you could you may be able to do undo do anything that you have done but you cannot unsay and especially on the diplomacy uh, but what you are describing as first of all you know whether there is a pressure on bangladesh on joining quad i'm not sure about it uh, united states have expressed interest that bangladesh, they would like to see bangladesh part of ipf right uh, uh, you know in the strategic and of course uh, they're trying to sell weapons you know hence there has been this weapons diplomacy at the late stage of the trump administration we have seen that has been going on for quite some time 
So is there a pressure from Bangladesh to join the Quad? Uh, I don't see that one yet. Is there an intention, expectation of joining IPS? Yes, there is. Uh, there is no doubt about it. Second thing that you mentioned, whether the BJP's rhetoric had demoralized. Uh, I would not say it has demoralized because the it has, has it made them uncomfortable, the Bangladesh government? Of course it has. They would have preferred it is not safe. Uh, but they also understand that this is the BJP strategy. BJP's politics depends on this, this kind of rhetoric. So it is the the demoralization is not something that I would agree with you because the relationship between Dhaka and Delhi is not determined on this, these issues. It is depending on the you know, continuation of the Bangladesh uh, posture towards India and its domestic uh, imperatives. You know, increasing authoritarianism needs to be supported by someone else. Hence, this, this relationship has remained very far since 2009. You know, there have been ups and downs previously, but a very stable relationship between Delhi. It is not the BJP, it is the Congress, which previously was there. <laughs> so let us not just blame, blame BJP for being so rude to, <laughs> rude to Bangladesh. The, the, the unequal relationship that we have seen between Bangladesh and India, until it was in India, of course, you know, and what Bangladesh has offered, which Bangladesh has not been received. Had there been any demoralization, that would have been the demoralization, not the rhetoric. But, but so I'm not calling it uncomfortability. Now, is China putting a pressure, as you have asked, that is, is China increasingly trying to exert its influence? China is trying to expand its sphere of influence. Let me put it this way. Uh, you know, and it has been in Africa and in South Asia, for understandable reason, China wants to see. Whereas India has always viewed South Asia as its backing, Bangladesh, Nepal, well, uh, that, that has been the policy, barring few exceptional moments of Indian history, that has been the approach. And when this idea that India has become the global power, or at least in the posture of Modi regime, that we have become the, they, they wanted to make sure like Monroe doctrine that our backyard is our backyard, no one is going to, come here. China is taking that step away, you know. China is trying to poke it in, in, in it and say, no, uh, uh, those days are gone. Those days are gone that you just said, you understand. That is what is happening here, you know. So these, and it is the extended part of Indian Ocean, the, the rivalry that we are witnessing with respect to uh, Sino-American, Rivalry in Indian Ocean, because Bay of Bengal is connected to Indian Ocean. You know, that's the fact of the geography. Having said that, this India and China's contestation is being played out in terms of energy. Now, which direction the government should go, Bangladesh government? So far, there are political imperatives, there are economic imperatives. Can you separate them? I don't think you can separate them. There's a political imperative or political leaning, or at least and uh, at least an incentive for the for the current Bangladesh government to us leaning towards China is also because of its authoritarian bent. Uh, China doesn't care about democracy. If there is a change in talent, four years down the line, three years down the line, whenever the next election, my point is, there could be some uh, pressure coming from Delhi of the, for democracy. And as part of the Quad, the Biden administration, uh, having those kind of things, how can they protect that? They need a shield, and that shield is China, because China's uh, preference for not so democratic, let me put it bluntly, uh, undemocratic governments based on the legitimacy of performance. That is, that has been the case of the last five, six, seven years of the Bangladesh incumbent one week's strategy. So you'll have to see this within this larger context. So I'm not, nobody is putting a pressure, neither Quad nor China is, is putting a pressure on Bangladesh is making, and in that respect, you know, uh, Mr. Momin, the foreign minister is right in saying that Bangladesh is a sovereign state, they will make its foreign policy. What would be the consideration of making that decision? That part is unclear. 
or at least the Mr. Momin is not telling us. I think the political imperative has gone more into this decision making than the uh, long term national interest guiding the principles of Bangladesh. And that's my opinion, you know. Take it and throw it. You know. uh, I will stop there. So. Okay. Thank you. Uh... Dr. Riaz for talking about whether, you know, uh, Bangladesh should or should not be joining the Quad in view of, you know, what the policymakers probably think in uh, Dhaka. So uh, we before we uh, move on to uh, Q&A uh, from the audience, so just want to give, uh, you know, all our speakers um, any uh, concluding uh, comments, you know, um, you know, that you want to make on the regional resonance of uh, in the, the, the elections that happened in West Bengal and Assam um, and their results on the, the broader region. And uh, you each have one minute for that. And uh, we'll start start off with uh, ladies first, uh, Dr. Guha Chakurta and then uh, Shoeb and then, uh, then Dr. Riaz. Thank you uh, for that, um, for giving me that minute. But uh, I think, um, uh, I, yeah, I would actually like, like to continue what I was going to say about this um, this uh, displacement issue uh, that uh, that we face with the Rohingyas in, in the fact that we now know that um, the 82 uh, Citizenship Act created all these problems within the Rohingyas, the execution of that, which led to the ultimate uh, outflow of citizens uh, of Rohingyas in 1990. So it took them about uh, almost eight years to, um, you know, for this to happen. So this is something that is um, a trajectory which we may or may not find uh, in in terms of Assam and and the um, and how far the BJP will go towards re-evaluation of this NRC and create complications which may not lead to deportation, but already we know that many um, Muslims have started coming in. And you know that one of the problems of this region is the porous borders. No fencing can uh, stop anything. You know, the, uh, the electrical fences are totally, uh, you know, absolutely um, obsolete when it comes to people's flow and the need to flow. We've seen it time and time again. Um, so this is something that we do have to be in, uh, uh, sort of concerned about, uh, that the people uh, themselves, some of them might want to come to Bangladesh and are flowing into Bangladesh uh, because they still have relatives here, because they have, uh, I know that many um, Urdu speaking people, for example, the Biharis, they in 71, they also went back into Bihar. And um, uh, so these are issues. This uh, this is something the geopolitics should take into account. I mean, if our our governments, both governments, are not alert about the issues of borders and borderland mm -hmm. and managing borders, then um, the eastern boundary will see some real uh, real problems, or uh, as a as a result of the NRCs and the CAA if they go on, go ahead to do that. Okay, all right, thank you, uh, Dr. Guha Thakurta. And, uh, you know, thanks for being so honest about it. It's not uh, always something that we uh, get to hear uh, from uh, scholars in uh, Dhaka on, on this issue. I mean, there are probably uh, certain restrictions, but uh, anyway, so uh, we will uh, move to Shoeb and if you can, uh, you know, wrap up in uh, one minute, uh, you know, what you think, uh, how the region should be seeing the results of this election and, uh, you know, uh, how it would play out in the, you know, in the uh, years to come. Obviously, results are extremely important for India domestically, uh, given what they mean for uh, India's uh, future politics. It really puts the BGP on a back foot, uh, given the amount of uh, resources and time and money that it's spent on West Bengal. So that is an extremely stark uh, implication for India domestically. It does have a small implication for Bangladesh domestically, I think, but not too much. Uh, I mean, I picked up some uh, chatter domestically in Bangladesh regarding uh, the opposition being uh, somewhat uh, pleased with the Trinamool winning, but I don't think that it's, you know, it's really very noteworthy. 
uh, also you know as i said earlier just to again wrap up i don't think it's going to have a very significant influence on india bangladesh relations is going to have a bit it's going to have a few uh, ups and downs here but overall india bangladesh relations are based on extremely uh, larger factors uh, which are really uh, not going to be affected by uh, uh, the the west bengal and assam elections if anything given that it puts the bjp on the back foot right now uh, it might uh, dissuade the party we'll have to go go and see whether it really does but it might one possibility is that the bjp uh, uh, you know is more uh, is more uh, it, it raises this issue of you know quote unquote bangladeshi illegal immigration into india less and less which would actually help uh, make help help any bangladesh government reach out to india a lot easier so that's about it. thank you all right thank you shoaib and uh, professor riaz uh, how should uh, policy makers in dhaka be seeing it and how are they seeing it uh, can you shed light on that please it's not the regional implication let's call it the uh, uh, let's call it sub regional implication i would rather because it doesn't impact india's relations sri lanka nepal or maldives for that Bangladesh uh, relationship with India would not be determined by who is in West Bengal. It is not. Would Bangladeshi some part of the Bangladeshi society be more comfortable having um, uh, uh, Mamata Banerjee and having this notion that there is this Bengali cultural affinity and these and that? Yes, there will. But at the same time, as we have heard from the, from many of the speakers, particularly. to make no contact there are supporters of modi and within the within the not only within the minority community within the larger non minority community in bangladesh there are for political reasons if you talk to it's it's like supporting trump in in the united states <laughs> you know you support the trump why there are 300 different reasons that you could find i cannot find a single you know uh, the the point is this uh, that assam election is a continuation of what assam was so what is new nothing new. nothing is new there. west bengal it is a as a matter of fact status quo except that bjp was gaining ground and it has gained ground and which i think uh, based on what i've heard this morning my morning and the previous session it is going to have a very large long term cultural implication You know, political culture. So those things being said, you know, uh, whether uh, is is it going to resonate further in in the coming years? Uh, if if I'm not absolutely wrong, I don't think it. Dhaka Delhi relationship will be determined by Dhaka Delhi, you know, not uh, whether Mamata Banerjee is. will there be a little bit of uncomfortable irritations here and there yes and increasingly there is the larger geopolitics will play whether the india can india maintain its posture of this the uh, you know south asia being the back here you know nepal has shown its stars sri lanka is a, in a different direction maldives had this problems so this larger geopolitical scene would determine the relationship and bangladesh domestic politics and the politics of the country with respect to where they want to stand to maintain themselves in power their political party they want to be in power right whether it is through the question or through the consent is a different issue but any political party want to be in power they're, they're not charity organization of you know so that's why two things it is a sub regional thing rather than region the second thing is the resonance would be limited unless there is a dramatic shift in dhaka delhi relationship okay all right so uh so we'll move on to q and a and we have a couple few uh you know questions here already in the q and a tab so uh you know the first question interestingly uh goes back to you i mean uh, uh dr riaz i mean uh from you know the round one questions i mean uh, i think you uh talked about the misconception of a hindu minority community i think you were talking about uh, land grabbing in that uh, that uh, in that con uh, context so uh the question here is that uh, uh so 
what can you en enlighten us about the uh, potential reasons for this misconception? So this misconception of a Hindu minority community in Bangladesh. I think you were talking about the land grabbing issue and you were talking about how, you know, because they're marginalized and they're uh, mostly uh, lower caste Hindus, uh, they are, you know, uh, they are vulnerable. Uh, can you shed light on that a little bit more? Absolutely. I mean, you have already pointed out uh, that two things, you know, one is that the, the common perception is that persecution of the Hindu community, and this has been wrapped around this uh, secular religion binary divide, that as if they are being just persecuted because of religion. They are persecuted because they're vulnerable. And they're vulnerable because they're on the margin of the society. Within the Hindu community, most of them are actually marginalized too. You know. Now, then if you have a culture of impunity where you can grab land, you know, it's not only the Hindus in large number, maybe it's disproportionately in the large number of Hindus because they're smaller in terms of the population. But isn't it happening elsewhere? I mean, the extortion is not going in in Dhaka. As, as we speak, maybe during this past uh, year, there has been significant extortion that we do not know it. You know. So the, the culture of impunity of this, you know, complete, uh, you know, control uh, and politicization of the administration by the ruling party and its operatives and their loyalists and their supporters are going after everybody they, they can, you know. And therefore, when I'm saying that, you know, this is the misperception because it has been seen as if it is only religious. Religion plays as one part, but the marginalization and particularly, particularly the absence of rule of law, particularly this partisan nature of the administration. If, let us face the fact, if an Awami leaker, influential Awami, and I would, I would suggest you to read and anyone interested, the, the, the Buddhist and the Hindu and the Christians, you know, they have this organization, the last year's support. You know, they also have identified that this is the ruling parties, activists and loyalists who are doing these kind of things. Because you have to have impunity, you have to have the local administration support. Suggesting that they are being done by suddenly dropping from corners where else is, is not true, you know. That's why I'm suggesting. And the second point, I will be very brief. The second point is that within the minority community, it is not homogeneous. Let us not say just because someone is Hindu and this way or someone is Christian. There are, you know, uh, social hierarchy. As it happens with the Muslim community, or for that matter, majority community, there are beneficiaries of this current ruling system. Let us, as it is, let us let. Don't put me as a, as, as a very communal person, you know, of course, because that is happening with the Muslim community. That is happening with elsewhere. Too. I mean, look at the children and health situation, right? So marginalization is not you know, unidimensional. It is multidimensional marginality that creates this kind of situation. Okay, all right. So, um, all right, so we have another question and uh, that uh, will go to Shoeb. And, um, you know, um, CM uh, Banerjee, uh, Mamta Banerjee, um, has an economic policy that unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, has not delivered well for the last many years. So whoever's asking this, this is not my question, just so you know. So even domestic industries are moving out of Bengal. Bangladesh, on the other hand, is comparatively doing well in inviting international business. Do you think politics can be playing a role in improving the economy? You know, since she's come back, would industries come back to Beng uh, West Bengal? That's basically the question. So yeah, I mean, firstly, Mamata Banerjee has not done very badly on the economic front. Uh, West Bengal's growth rates have generally, especially rural growth rates, have actually outstripped India over the last decade. But yes, there is no doubt about the fact that Bangladesh has done, uh, you know, uh, incredibly better 
uh, we've sort of <laughs> we've sort of overturned if you look at you know uh, the pre 1947 bengal province where west bengal was the definitely much richer side compared to eastern bengal it has been overturned and now east bengal or bangladesh is now quite a bit richer than bangladesh so yes in theory if there was better trade there was better human interconnectivity uh, you know if we had all of that uh, west bengal would benefit uh, from uh, trade with bangladesh but unfortunately this is you know not really dependent on uh, uh, the, the the election in west bengal this is largely an indian foreign policy uh, measure so on that sense actually india uh, india bangladesh relations are actually on a 50 year high i think they've never been better since the 1970 on liberal liberation war uh, you know bangladesh has awarded transit rights to india and so on and so forth the, the, the host of uh, things that india has done with bangladesh so in that sense that uh, west bengal could benefit from it but is is really got nothing to do with the election per se it's more to do with larger foreign policy goals so all right little, yeah okay so uh, i think we have to wrap up now so we are slightly over time so uh, thank you uh, shoeb uh, shoeb daniel uh, the senior assistant editor of scroll india uh, you may have been uh, reading a lot of his writings. I certainly do. And uh, then we had uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Meghna Guhathakurta, Executive uh, Director of Research Initiatives uh, Bangladesh, and Dr. Ali Riaz, my colleague at the Atlantic Council Non-Resident Senior Fellow, and also the um, Distinguished Professor of Political Science um, at Illinois State uh, University in the US. So thank you very much. And I certainly had a lot of fun uh, moderating this session and I will hand it over to my colleague Indrajit at York. Uh, thank you Indrajit I, uh, you know, for your um, uh, effort and uh, Buddha, uh, Buddha's effort in uh, organizing this uh, webinar. And uh, certainly I think our audience learned a lot. I certainly did. So uh, over to you Indrajit. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I have to second what Rudabe said. We're very privileged to have uh, panelists who uh, joined us from uh, very diverse uh, geographies at very short notice. So uh, thanks, Meghana, for joining us from Bangladesh. Thanks, uh, Harsh, Kasturi, Shoeb, and Aman, who joined us from India, and Ali, who joined us from the Midwest United States, I think it is, so very early in the morning for you. In the first panel, uh, we obtained insights on the social consequences of the elections for West Bengal and Assam. And in the second panel, our speakers walked us through the broader regional and international ramifications of the elections. Um, we are very grateful for the way in which you took us through both the domestic and international dimensions. Uh, it's not often that one discusses foreign policy dynamics of domestic elections. Uh, but it was not something we could ignore in the present context, given, as our speakers have said, the way in which uh, Bangladesh was invoked in the elections. Uh, you know, parties played the Bangladesh card, parties played the Indian card, sorry, parties played the Bangladesh card in India and the India card in Bangladesh. I, our speakers also cautioned us against limiting our focus on the BJP. Uh, rather, we have to keep reminding ourselves that the uh, of the growing political culture uh, associated with Hindutva more broadly, and what that might mean for uh, for for Eastern India and uh, and its immediate neighbourhood. Our speakers didn't seem too worried about India Bangladesh relations destabilizing, despite the rhetoric of the BJP. So that was, um, I suppose, a, a, a nice takeaway. Um, despite the, the enormous, uh, obviously, implications on domestic politics. Uh, however, if the local units of the BJP were allowed to prevail, then of course, the discomfort that one sees between India and Bangladesh, or rather in Bangladesh vis-a-vis -vis India is likely to increase. Moreover, and this was a sober reminder, if the BJP were to push ahead with something like the CAA and NRC, you could possibly see large scale population transfers in Eastern India, as we saw in the India-Pakistan border during the 1940s. And obviously, if that were to come by, that would be, uh, that would be terrifying. But be that as it were, uh, at the moment, it seems that um, you know, the, the, the border may not be terribly unstable, although we, we can expect that India's ambitions to lead the 
uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region that uh, you know has excited po foreign policy observers quite a bit. Um, India's ambitions to lead the Indo-Pacific may not be as uh, easily sort of come to fruition as India would like. So anyway, these are some broad, um, uh, I suppose, uh, themes that our speakers from both the panels uh, got us to think about. Uh, and I'm very grateful that you did that. Um, and thanks to our audience uh, for joining us at this first webinar of our politics, citizenship and democracy in South Asia series that uh, is co-convened by the University of York Department of Politics, the Atlantic Council uh, South Asia Center and the Chatham House Asia Pacific Program. We're very grateful you could make it despite the terrifying situation in India and its neighborhood. Thanks once again and stay safe everyone. Take care. Thank you. Care, everyone. Okay, I think Thank we you. can. Um, I think the way out is to press the leave button, which will very rudely cut everyone off. But uh, 